Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. A fleet of U.S. and U.K. aircraft carriers are sailing near China. It's one of the world's most powerful fleets. Carrying hundreds of long-range missiles, it boasts more firepower than most countries reserve in their entire naval force. NTD's Don Ma has more. The U.S. and the U.K. have assembled one of the world's most powerful naval formations near China in the waters surrounding Okinawa, Japan. It's among the most formidable group of ships to sail together in years, and it's not a coincidence that it appeared near China's coast. Recently, Beijing has been increasing its military assertiveness in the region, mainly towards Taiwan. The joint U.S.-U.K. move indicates a potential warning to China's Communist Party, or CCP, that upsetting the status quo in the region could be matched with a powerful response. For China, this is a warning sign. It's undeniable that the U.S. military deployment and military strength in the Indo-Pacific region cannot be underestimated. The naval formation is composed of three aircraft carriers. That's the USS America, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, and the nuclear-powered USS Carl Vinson. A former Chinese Communist Party military personnel tells NTD that in a military confrontation, China is no match for America's power. Why does the United States place such a large force on the Western Pacific and at the doorstep of the CCP? I think it is a strategic deterrence. It's to tell the CCP to settle down. In an actual confrontation, this force is terrifying and very powerful. I think the CCP couldn't defend against it. The Naval Assembly is part of the two countries' maritime deployment operations. Those operations also include training exercises. And on each carrier are dozens of advanced fighter jets. In total, they carry nearly 80 combined aircrafts. These carriers are accompanied by Dutch and British support escorts. These carriers are also sporting several submarines and hundreds of long-range missiles. Together, these carriers and escorts possess more firepower than most countries have in their entire naval fleets. By comparison, China currently deploys just two aircraft carriers. Don Ma, NTD News. And two of the FDA's senior vaccine regulators are leaving the agency within the next few months. This comes nearly a week after the FDA approved the Pfizer vaccine and as boosters and shots for children are under review. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. The director of the FDA's Office of Vaccines Research and Review, or OVRR, Dr. Marion Gruber and her deputy, Dr. Philip Krauss, are leaving the FDA. The agency confirmed the departures Tuesday after BioCentury broke the news. The departures come at a particularly crucial time as booster shots and vaccines for children are being reviewed by the regulator. Gruber, who was with the FDA for 32 years, was one of the two FDA officials who signed the agency's letter of approval for the Pfizer vaccine last week. According to a memo from Peter Marks, director of the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Gruber plans to retire on October 31st, and Krauss plans to leave the FDA in November. The memo did not give a reason for their departures. According to Endpoints News, a former senior FDA leader told the outlet they're leaving because they're frustrated with the CDC's involvement in decisions that they think should be up to the FDA, and that the final straw was the White House getting ahead of the agency on booster shots. A reporter asked White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zeitz about these reports Tuesday during a briefing and whether he's concerned the resignations will affect trust in the FDA and its ability to review vaccines. The FDA has strong leadership in Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Peter Marks at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and their critical work continues as we work to get safe and effective vaccines to the American people. As for the booster shots, Zayed said they made the announcement early in order to allow time for preparation and to be transparent. Dr. Marks will serve as the OVRR's acting director while the FDA finds a replacement to lead the division. Grace Coulter, NTD News. And over on Capitol Hill, even with Congress out of session this week, a large group of Republican lawmakers still made their way to the House floor to observe a moment of silence together, 
honoring the 13 Americans who lost their lives in the terrorist bombing in Kabul last week. The GOP lawmakers also spoke about the end of the evacuation mission, with many Americans and Afghan allies left in the country. A moment of silence on the House floor as lawmakers honor the U.S. servicemen and women who lost their lives at the Kabul airport during the recent suicide bombing. And House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy led a large group of veteran GOP representatives to share their thoughts on the end of the Afghanistan evacuation mission. It's too late to save face. We look weak. Our allies are questioning our commitment. Our enemies are seeking to test us. It's too late to save face. But we can still save lives. They want to take action to save the Americans still left in the country, although it's difficult to move any Republican-backed legislation since Democrats have the majority in the House. The Republicans are still urging House Speaker Pelosi to call lawmakers back from their weeks-long recess to take up this issue. Republicans now pushing to pass a bill that would force the Biden administration to give regular updates on Americans still in Afghanistan. It would also require an evacuation plan to be laid out in detail. Whereas just two weeks ago, the president promised this nation that he would not leave until every single American was out. It is still unclear exactly how many Americans are still stuck in Afghanistan, even as the evacuation mission has ended. The Pentagon spokesperson said Tuesday morning more than 100 Americans are still in Afghanistan, and earlier in the day he said a few hundred. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken last night in his press conference said it's less than 200, but it's closer to 100. Earlier in the day, he said it was 250. The fact of the matter is that this administration still has no idea how many Americans they have left behind, behind enemy lines. The Biden administration says that while the military mission with boots on the ground has ended, the State Department is still working on using other channels to rescue the Americans and Afghan allies left there. I believe that we're going to work, we're going to be able to get those people out. I think we're also going to negotiate very hard and very aggressively to get our other Afghan partners out. The military phase is over, but our desire to bring these people out remains as intense as it was before. The weapons have just shifted, if you will, from the military realm to the diplomatic realm, and the Department of State will now take the lead on that. McKenzie confirmed that the last five jets to leave Afghanistan had no American citizens. He says they were prepared to bring more Americans out on those last flights, but none of them had made it to the airport. And the situation in Afghanistan has gone from a troop withdrawal to what the Biden administration has called an evacuation. With 13 U.S. service members killed at the Kabul airport, nearly 90 retired high-ranking military officers have signed a letter calling for the resignation of those in charge. Since the situation drastically deteriorated in Afghanistan, Pentagon officials have suggested to the media and the public that there would be a time and a place to assess where things went wrong as the United States withdrew its presence from the war-torn country. However, for nearly 90 retired generals and admirals in the world's most powerful military, the time for this discussion is now. And that is why all 87 former high-ranking military officers have signed a letter calling for both Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley to resign. The letter was wide-ranging and pointed out how there was no concrete plan to evacuate civilians. The dozens of generals and admirals who signed the letter concluded that giving up Bagram Air Base was a dangerous decision, to which the president's military advisers should have strenuously objected. The letter went on to say that the military's shift toward political correctness has laid a groundwork for divisiveness and weakening of warfighting capabilities. Among the generals who signed the letter were retired Brigadier General Donald Bullduck, Lieutenant General Gerald Boykin, and Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney. They also said that the mistakes that were made present opportunities for adversaries like China, Russia, and Iran to take advantage of the situation. The letter is demanding accountability. Many have said that the best way to boost morale among the troops is for senior leadership to buck up and admit fault when mistakes are made. Steve Lance, NTD News, Washington, D.C. A Northern California teacher boasts about indoctrinating students with communist values in his classroom. Another teacher in Southern California is under investigation for suggesting her students recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the Pride flag. We hear more from NTD's Eileen Eck. 
Project Veritas released a video exposing a high school teacher admitting he indoctrinates his students with communist ideas. Gabriel Geip, an AP government teacher in Sacramento, could be heard talking about turning his students into revolutionaries. I have 180 days to turn them into revolutionaries. It's scary. The public school teacher believes in a change of cultural propaganda and tries to convince people that socialism is needed. He gives his students extra credit for creating an opposition at events. When there is like right wing rallies and stuff, then we like, she will create an opposition to that. Yeah. Beautiful. Where would he go to connect with some of these organizations? Like, no, I, I post a calendar okay, every week. Awesome. And then, so, like, they, it's, and I do it for extra credit. So they get points for doing it. Like, and so that encourages them to do it. <laughs> and I've, I've had like students show up for like protests, community events, you know, tabling, food distribution, all sorts of, sorts of things. They, when they go, they take pictures, they write up a reflection. That's their extra credit. Gaip also had students complain about things on his classroom wall. Like, I, I have an Antifa flag on my on my wall, um, and a student complained about that, and he said it made him feel uncomfortable. And I, had, I addressed it to everyone because I didn't know who it was, and I was like, well, this is meant to make fascists feel uncomfortable, so if you feel uncomfortable, I, I don't really know what to tell you. <laughs> like, maybe you shouldn't be aligning with the, the values that it, this is antithetical to. In a student news production called Tiger Talk posted on YouTube, the political spectrum and images of Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong are the background. Gaip said there are three other teachers that share his view. NTD reached out to Gaip, the school principal, and Natomas Unified School District, but did not receive a response by deadline. In Orange County, Southern California, another teacher is under investigation for posting a video on social media suggesting her students salute the pride flag instead of the American flag. In the TikTok video, she said she took down the American flag during the pandemic because it made her feel uncomfortable. She packed it away and does not know where it is. My kid today goes, hey, um, it's kind of weird that we just stand and then, you know, we say it to nothing. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I got to find it. Like, I'm working on it. I got you. <laughs> in the meantime, I tell this kid, we do have a flag in the class that you can pledge your allegiance to and he like looks around and he goes oh that one <laughs> in a public statement the school district said we take matters like this seriously showing respect for our nation's flag is an important value that we instill in our students and an expectation of our employees the teacher is no longer in the classroom we follow due process and our investigation continues eileen ang ntd news california if you want to live somewhere that you don't own you have to pay rent at least under normal circumstances. But due to the eviction moratorium, tenants who were affected by the pandemic couldn't be evicted even if they didn't pay. Now, the moratorium is set to expire. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. Behind us, you can see a number of advocacy groups for tenants. They want Kathy Hochul, the new governor of New York, to extend the eviction ban. Now, the Biden administration also wanted to extend the federal eviction ban recently, but that move was blocked by the Supreme Court. This is a crisis issue. Get into session and expand the moratorium. It is simple as that. Some tenants depend on the eviction ban to keep their housing. But others abuse the system and don't pay even though they might have the money, causing problems for landlords. Landlords can ask for emergency rent relief from the state. But if they take that money, they can't evict their tenants for another year. Two weeks ago, I went to a rally calling for an end to the eviction ban. One of the landlords there explained her problem with the rent relief program. If you have problematic tenants like I do that have violence going on, violence, guns, fighting, so it's kind of like a trap, like, yeah, I'm 20 plus thousand dollars in debt, so I want to take the money, but then if I do that, I can't evict them. I told her story to one of the organizers at the pro-eviction moratorium rally. Well, that's one scenario and that does not impact the entire cases of the state. I would tell her to encourage them to apply for the emergency rent relief application. I asked an attendee who's running for public office, what's the middle ground to serve both tenants and landlords? There is no middle ground. We need an evic eviction moratorium immediately from the state. Some tenants have had bad experiences with landlords in the past, which is why they're calling for the eviction ban. Usually tenants who pay and behave well don't get evicted, 
right? You would think so, but that's what ends up happening because people who many times are in rent regulated buildings, meaning they have more than six apartments and can't increase their rent with a tenant who's already been living there. So they may not renew a lease because they want to increase it for a new community that's coming in. He added that in some cases landlords harass these tenants until they move out if they can't evict them. Aaron Pastar, NTD News, New York. China is now seeing a surge of a deadly disease called anthrax. It's emerged in at least three provinces, and officials just announced the first human death case in a decade. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. A deadly and highly infectious disease has surfaced in at least three Chinese provinces. It's called anthrax, and this month marks China's first human death case linked to the disease in 10 years. That's based on official figures. The death struck in the country's Shandong province. Nearly 5,000 others there were found to have had contact with confirmed patients or related animals. They've since been put under isolation and are receiving preventive medical treatment. A weekly report from Shandong CDC revealed that two confirmed anthrax cases were reported to the agency in mid-August. The first patient, a 14-year-old student, died at the beginning of the month. He had developed symptoms like fever, fatigue and convulsions. The CDC's weekly report was released August 27th, over 20 days after the first patient's death. The second patient was linked to the first, having visited the first patient's home to help slaughter cattle. Doctors later diagnosed him with cutaneous anthrax. That means he caught the infection through skin contact with the bacterium. Anthrax is often found in cattle and sheep. Human infection can happen after contact with sick animals or contaminated products. The most dangerous form of the infection is pulmonary anthrax, caused by inhaling droplets or dust containing the bacterium. It has a fatality rate of over 80 percent. Those infected develop flu-like symptoms, like a sore throat, mild fever and fatigue. That worsens into shortness of breath and may cause death. Shandong isn't the only part of China facing the problem. On August 9th, city authorities in Beijing also reported an anthrax case. The patient came from the neighboring Hebei province and had a history of contact with local cattle and sheep. He had traveled to Beijing for medical treatment days after symptoms developed. Local media outlets have not published follow-up reports on the patient's situation after treatment. Elsewhere in central China's Shanxi province, nine people developed symptoms, including blisters, ulcers and dark spots. Eight of them were later diagnosed with anthrax. Local officials say the origin of the bacterium hasn't been found yet. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to catch all of our programs on TV. NTD Evening News is on every weekday at 6.30 p.m. Find your local NTD channel at ntd.com slash TV.